What up, gang? This is Ken Zerk, Ken Zilling, and Zika Milling, and the villain from the trailer. And we are back on Corpse Party Blood Drive. Man, last episode, I can't really even like say nothing. It was just crazy. And I'm excited to get back into this. I'm supposed to be recording P5. I planned on recording Dongan Rampa 3 and this all at the same time, but I've been so addicted to this. I've never like, been, I've never been so stuck on a game where I've had to completely drop Persona. You feel me? Persona made me drop Danganronpa. And now Chorus Part is making me drop Persona. Bro, this game is so, I love this game. Let's get into chapter seven, Determination. Okay, if y'all remember last episode, things are like really hectic right now. Like the world is probably, the, the world is in danger. <laughs> Uh, what did I say? The world's in danger. It's the end of the world as we know it. The sounds of fire trucks and patrol cars echoed through the streets. The sky was dark. The air stale and the many strong, cold gusts of wind bore mass amounts of dust and debris. I didn't envy the reporter her job as she seemed mere moments from being blown off her feet. But to her credit, she persevered. Behind her, there was a black shadow of an old man. I'm here reporting on what's been dubbed the nationwide ghost disaster state, which local representatives claim is now ineffective as of last night. This string of unexplained and potentially unexplainable deaths that have been plaguing the city presently shows no signs of letting up. Suspicious and sudden demises, homicides with unknown motives, and reports of paranormal visitations are all increasing at an alarming rate. The police forces in each prefecture are still weighing their options for dealing with this issue, and few have made any official statements thus far, frustratingly. The old man's shadow in the background began acting strangely, jumping in place and making various other aimless motions. The Metropolitan Police, meanwhile, have suggested that all locals travel to a safe location in groups of three or more as soon as possible, remaining indoors until further notice. The sudden devastating appearance of the black pillars throughout Japan last night has also led the MLIT to declare a state of emergency, setting up disaster shelters and lookouts. Official word from local bureaus on how these pillars are affecting traffic, the status of damage to the rivers, as well as any countermeasures being taken care being taken can be seen here. Experts have analyzed the pillars' composition and concluded that they're made of a previously unknown material. They've tossed around names like Spirit Matter and Entity Wall. Due to the rapid growth and the complete inability of even seismographs to predict where they may spawn, the number of casualties is quite high, and global tensions are even higher. Everything up to the up to including industrial cutters and blades have been employed in an attempt to cut through these objects with absolutely no effect. The Ministry of Defense is using JSDF, JF, JSDF data to explore the strong possibility that these pillars are related in some way to the aerial spear that's hovered over our skies only days ago. I have here a list of newly appointed relief shelters, so if you live in one of those designated evacuation areas, please take note of the information on your screen. This information is also available on our website and through our mobile app, but do note that any gymnasiums and schools shown, are white and shown in white are full. So please, so you'll need to look somewhere else. We strongly recommend that you proceed to the nearest open facility as soon as possible. But if these things can sprout up anywhere without warning and give you no time to escape, evacuation is meaningless. It's not a damn thing anybody can do to stay safe. Whether you die or not, it's just dumb luck. When the hell are the police going to get out their asses and make a statement? Are they scared of public outcry? Are they hiding something? The middle-aged announcement was yelling at the top of his lungs. In an absolute frenzy, he kicked his studio desk to the ground. A black shadow of a woman could be seen behind him. What? Thank you for bringing us back to life. You mean I did it? I was about to say, but a whole lot more people have died now. 
The room grew dark and each of the four figures who stood before me slowly melted into the blackness, becoming indistinct silhouettes. Even Mochida, Nakashime, and Kishinuma have died. So many people are gone. What's this? Even we haven't actually been revived, huh? What was it you were trying to do again, Ayumi? I screamed and looked up. It was just a dream. I was at home watching TV. I scrunched myself up again, putting my face to my knees. Bring them back, bring them back. I was like a broken record with that, but it was a doomed idea from the start. Everything I've done has been pointless. So what do I do now? Thought I could revive them, I really did. I mean, even if I could come back from Yoshie's house beside those memories and losing my sister, then anybody should be able to come back. I raised my face from my knees, eyes red and burning. Then as if I ever already had enough tragedy in my life, I heard a loud crash just outside my house, unmistakably a car wreck, a rather severe one. Why y'all having car wrecks in front of my crib? The car's alarm was going off, but I was trying my best to ignore it. I didn't need this right now. <laughs> I was simply not gonna bother with it. <laughs> sis, what do I do, sis? Sis. Oh my goodness. You got the nerve to crash your car in front of my house, and now you want to not ring on my doorbell. Up next, we learn the CEO of PL Promotions Co. Inc. has gone uh, is among those who've gone missing. Hell no. The car alarm was still going off, and it was only getting harder and harder to ignore it by the second. She looks pissed. Shut up! What? Who's... Whoever was ringing my doorbell was really, really persistent. The irregular sound brought me back to reality. I crept over to the peephole and silently looked through it to see who had been visiting me at this hour. On the other side of the door stood a man I didn't recognize. He had short air hair as if he was pressing the chime frantically as if his life depended on it. Who is that? I was kind of creeped out. I really shouldn't open the door. I'm gonna kick that bitch in. I moved away from the peephole. Oh my goodness, he might have pissed me off. Just open the door! The persistent ringing continued from a, for a bit. But then, think finally, thankfully. Thanks for the butt hook. He about to kick it in. I slowly crept back to the peephole and took another look. He's looking through the peephole. The man was still there. He was just pacing back and forth in front of a house that, for all he knew, had no occupants. Whoa. After another short while, he approached the door again and immediately put his right eye up to the outside of the peephole. If I move now, he totally knew I was here. The man moved his head away, but quickly placed, replaced it with his finger, which he swirled around and around inside the tight space as if trying to reach my eye or poke it out. Then he stepped away from the door. I could have taken his opportunity to slowly move away from the peephole, but I was oddly transfixed. Thank God. Now all he has to do is leave. Of course, the second I thought that he came back to the door yet again. Yet again, he skipped the doorbell and went straight for the peephole. What does he want? Why isn't he saying anything? This is really creeping me out. Fine, I'll just open the door and give him a piece of my mind. I grabbed the doorknob and was moments away from following through with that plan when suddenly... Ayumi? Ayumi? Sachika? Don't open it. He's dead. I slowly turned to look at her. The Nirvana is the world of the dead. And that world is coming here.
Then there was an oddly familiar sound. Another car accident again right outside my door. <gasps> this time I looked outside through the peephole and saw the man from earlier sandwiched between a car and the wall of one of the houses across the street. He was absolutely mangled. <laughs> but after a few moments, the man's corpse disappeared, leaving nothing but a shadow in its place on the wall, a ground like a black stain. Maya? My fault. What is this? What's happening to the world? Not that I even had to really ask. Is this from breaking down the walls of the Nirvana? I wasn't just asking myself, I was asking Sachiko, whose presence still remained just behind my back. But she just looked up at me with sad eyes. The person just now was one of the deceased, and if he turned into a black stain, then... No, it couldn't be. I pulled my smartphone from my pocket and forced myself to remain calm enough to access the photo, but then just stopped and stared. What's wrong? The photo displayed on my phone, which was now on the floor. They really are dead! No longer had just my friends from before with blacked out faces, but Mochida, Nakashima, and Kishinuma as well. I pounded the floor with both hands and shut it violently. <laughs> The end of the world is nigh. God shall not forgive those who are unclean and indiscreet. Some cultist group was speaking on TV. I guess the news must have ended at some point when I wasn't paying attention. The end of the world, huh? This time I was just plain talking to myself. Magari? Oh, she so I figured she wouldn't have just died from that. So, oh, That's right, the end. Who would have thought the last remaining Yogora could have been enough could have enough suicide bomber determination to dream up something like this? Magari appeared in my hallway. I had no idea how long she'd been there or how she'd gotten in. I noticed she still had her heels on though. It's you. First of all, apologize for not listening to her. I stood up and Sachiko was, as always, waiting in the wings behind me. I came back with the Ever After Stones. I used them in midair while I was falling down the bell tower. Heavenly Host is totally destroyed though, so these are just plain ordinary stones now. To demonstrate, Magari snapped the two together. Nirvana, I summon the dead. See? I probably flinched, but she was right. Nothing happened. Within the next few hours, this world will be totally blanketed in chaos. It's going to be the new land of the dead. Sucks, huh? This is seriously the cataclysm. And to top it all off, that's my order on TV there. That's my order on TV there. Fucking shameless, aren't they? Even I've got to draw the line at that point. She pulled back her chin and flashed me a strange smile. Oh, yeah. Your parents went crazy and joined, so you know. This day could have been much worse for me. This day couldn't have been much worse for me. Are you okay leaving things like this then? Magari wasn't mincing words, it seemed. I held my head in both hands and looked down at the ground. If you feel responsible, come with me for a bit. I have something to discuss with you about your bloodline. Magari approached me and grabbed my arm. About to say, Sachiko looks ready to pounce. 
Sachiko still right behind me began growling like a guard dog. Get your hands off me! I can't even save my friends! I can't do anything! I don't know what the hell the difference but difference that the blood of the Shinazaki is supposed to make! But I'm just Ayumi and Ayumi is worthless! Besides, the person who first introduced me to this Nirvana was the, uh, to this world was Yoshi, not me! I screamed as loudly and fiercely as I could. I, I didn't do anything wrong! I closed my eyes and cried the hardest I've ever cried, sobbing so intensely that I found myself nearly hyperventilating. Damn! Magari slapped me down to the ground. You're one stubborn bitch, you know that? Got one hell of an ego, too! For once in your life, just suck it up! Thank you, Magari's saying the things that need to be said. I held my cheek and continued sobbing. Magari was looking down on me with contempt in her eyes, but also a certain intensity that seemed more akin to desperation than anything. Ayumi Shinazaki, here's one fact you should know. Once the seventh pillar, the Sephirot of knowledge starts up, it's all over. The end of the world is carved in stone. However, Magar closed in on me as if our lips were about to touch. Tachiko growled again, but Magarla was clearly not intimidated in the slightest. The Book of Shadows isn't gone yet. You came in contact with the original book, so since you draw the blood of the Shinazaki, you may yet be able to fight Misuto. I was still hesitating, and Magari apparently didn't much like that. Ah, just come the fuck on! Suddenly, Magari was pulling up the top of my uniform. My plump white stomach was now fully exposed. That piece of shit book is right here. She pointed to a spot just below my belly button. As she did so, my stomach started growling with an unearthly roar and shifted in place slightly. It was almost like there was a snake slithering around inside of me. Sure, it would have been nice if you noticed that a little sooner. That thing's been sleeping inside you since you first used its power in the basement of Yoshe Shinazaki's estate. Magari crossed her arms and snorted. Of course, it's only a container. Nothing's in it right now. <laughs> Running like a cocky bastard. The growl that came from within my own belly sounded like that of a wild beast. There's no way. Is this for real? I was actually tricked pretty good. Originally, the elders sent me to support you in your efforts to obtain the Book of Shadows from that other realm, among other things. Okay? But of course, that still means I was planning on stealing it from you as soon as you got your hands on it. Now, though, that doesn't matter. If the world's going to pot, there's no, there's not really any meaning to, in becoming the heir of the Martubas anymore, is there? And that just fucking sucks. It all goes back to Misuto. Misuto. If that little fucker thinks he's won the war, he's got another thing coming. Don't you just want to slaughter him like a pig right now? I certainly do. I hate the guy. You just stop being such a pussy and look at all the things you're capable of. There'll be, there'll be time enough to abandon all your potential after you're dead. My ass began to well up yet again. Don't say that with that sweet smile on your face. Are you saying there's still something I can do? Magara's expression turned deathly serious. Do whatever you can to bring that Book of Shadows out of your body and gain control over it. If the book recognizes your determination, it should extract itself naturally. And if you have the power of the book at your disposal, it'll lead the way right back to Mishito's Nirvana. I could only stare incredulously at my abdomen. Magari took this opportunity to open my front door, again to illustrate her point. Outside, the weather was completely anomalous, with hurricane-like winds and debris clouds everywhere. The clouds up above, too, were moving abnormally fast through a disconcerting blood-red sky. 
Every few seconds, a sound not unlike a spark plug firing could be heard echoing from the distance as another black flame ignited and burned itself out in some random spot. I mean, you're gonna lie down and die with this world either way. So what have you got to lose? Show me how tough you are while you still got the chance. Just remember, that book was born from black magic. It adores cruelty and blood. With those parting words, Magari disappeared into the city. The sounds of her heels clacking softer and softer until they were no longer audible at all. Sachiko and I could do nothing but see her off. The entire nation was now played with entity walls and black silhouette like spirits of the dead. The entity walls were rapidly destroying schools, downtown bypasses, and other crucial traffic cornerstones and even rescue shelters, creating countless new casualties by the minute. People were running in the streets, panicked and confused, and almost certainly not much longer for this earth. Where are we supposed to go? It doesn't matter, just run or you'll be crushed. What about overseas? How are you gonna get there with the sky and the ocean both screwed up? Meanwhile, in Ms. Kuan's office, the black-suited agents watched in horror as each TV monitor displayed a feed from a different news network across the world, and the story was exactly the same on all of them. <laughs> Boss, what are we supposed to do? Dang, all of them are really dead. And this is Corpse Party, so I can't, like, count on no Disney ending where they come back. Like, this this might really be the end of them. They might actually be dead. How is a book supposed to recognize my determination? What the hell am I supposed to do? I imagine they, um, I, my first thought was like, like literally, yeah, like the knife right there. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, my first thought is that they want you to literally rip it out. Like literally like rip it out of your stomach. That's what I'm thinking. Hold on. I want to check that mirror right quick because I know they be having some, they be doing some stuff with the mirrors. The reflection in the mirror looks like a whole other person. Ragged hair, pale skin, and expression of utter disdain are the standout features. Oh man, this music. I see, it looks like I have two choices right here. I can either jump out I can either jump out or I can click this. Sis, give me strength. In front of the mirror dresser sat Hanoi's zodiac dagger. I gripped it in terror, closed my eyes and started shaking. Do whatever you can to bring that book of shadows out of your body and gain control over it. Just remember, the book was born from black magic. It adores cruelty and blood. I couldn't back down now. I lifted the dagger in front of me, poised to plunge it into my body and carve myself open, as samurai once did in a ritualistic suicide called seppuku. But I couldn't go through with it. I was too scared of death, too scared of the pain. I, I can't, I can't. The face that reflected back at me in the mirror was twisted with fear. I didn't even recognize myself, but I could see in those eyes all the weight that had been put on my shoulders, all the responsibility I'd been forced to bear. I'm a coward. I'm small and weak. The world doesn't need me. I won't be missed. But I can make a difference here and now. My mind was made up. I lifted the dagger again. Only to blink it halfway to its destination before halting its descent once more. No matter how determined I was, no matter how strong my conviction, this was literally suicide. I knew what had to be done, but knowing and accepting are two different things. I began crying like a baby. This was the most afraid I'd ever been in my entire life, and almost certainly the most afraid I ever would be. At this point, the only way I'd be able to go through with it was to clear my mind and let my arms make the motions automatically. And before I knew it, that's exactly what I did. It's most likely because I wasn't thinking about it or anything else for that matter. 
that the dagger found absolutely no resistance. It was like applying excess force to a slice of cake. For a very brief moment, I felt nothing. Then convulsion started first in my abdomen, then quickly spreading up to the rest of my body. My abdomen was now spasming and constricting involuntarily, and the rest of me wasn't faring much better. My entire body was in total chaos. Come on, rip it out! Rip it out! The extent of agony I felt at that moment was absolutely impossible to convey. It was all encompassing. I was utterly incapable of focusing on anything else. My lower body was spewing bright red blood, thick black blood, and an unknown yellow substance, all of which was blending together into a slurry that was at once my life essence. This went far beyond anything I could have ever imagined. The sheer shock of it rendered my mind a jumble that I simply could not untangle. I knew there was no reason I'd done this to m I knew there was a reason I'd done this to myself. Something I absolutely had to do, and it was crucial, but regaining enough cognitive function to do it would be a challenge. I can't do it! To cut across yet or remove the book, there's no way! Stop saying that and do it! My head was swimming as I tried. Beyond all reasonable measure to hang on to the consciousness just long enough to complete the task at hand. I could still see my face in the mirror, but only just as the blood that had begun spurting out, of, out from my spurting from my abdomen had largely glazed it over. It was a truly frightful sight, comparable to, if not more disturbing than anything I'd seen in Heavenly Host. I felt feeble, helpless, and the face in the mirror was smiling at me for it, darkly, obscenely. <laughs> Jet black crows flew by outside the window, and in that moment a fire sparked within me. Feeling oddly resolute, I gripped a dagger jutting out from my abdomen. Yeah, come on, you got this! And yanked it to the side with every last bit of strength I had left in me. The spray of blood gushing out of me began, became almost exponentially more violent. More surprisingly, it seemed like equal amounts of blood were rushing to my brain as well, and the effect was feeling like a blood vessel in my head were on the verge of bursting. But just as I felt like I was moments away from my final blackout, I saw something. There among my own entrails on the ground was a blood-drenched tome. It was the Book of Shadows without question. My vision blurred from the intense loss of blood and even more intense pain. I fell forward unable to maintain any semblance of balance any longer. And I landed right on it. With a loud, warm, and unpleasant splash, my face planted firmly into the book, which was seemingly under an odd temperature differentials of my viscera. I awoke with a start. I was still in Hinoe's room. Instinctively and frantically, I looked down at my abdomen. There I saw a scar resembling the ones I al I'd almost died from during the blowback at Yoshi Shinazaki's house. Runic lettering and all, but that was it. The bleeding had stopped. In fact, there was no blood anywhere in the room. And on the floor in front of me sat the Book of Shadows. Not a copy, but the original. This is... I slowly touched it. And from behind me, Sachiko spoke. The book has acknowledged you as its owner. She was staring at me with a docile, almost reverent look in her eyes. I picked up the book and looked at it in fear and awe running through my now clear head. Book of Shadows. <laughs> that was so funny, bro. It grumbled a bit, darting its eyes back and forth. Eventually, it seemed to settle on a specific direction, locking its gaze. It seemed to be looking out the window. What is that? Most likely the entrance to the Nirvana. Wait, Kisaragi Academy is in that direction. 
Dad, Mom! Thank goodness I was worried sick. They're dead. The world has ended. The world has ended. Dad? Mom? No. Leave. Let's not be stupid, Ayumi. I'll be back for you, I swear. Hold on! What's this? That was hard! Sachiko, I can't believe I'm saying this, but having you on my side is kind of reassuring. Sachiko looked at me with sweet, innocent eyes. He's like, uh, why can't you believe you're saying that? When I arrived at Kisaragi Academy, I got a much better look at the phenomenon. It was like a whirlpool with a red dully shining hole in its center. Was this the entrance of the ever after? Beyond that is a nirvana. Kinetic energy? Kinetic magic? Like how witches fly? No way. I closed my eyes. Clasped the Book of Shadows tightly in both hands and prayed. Book of Shadows, lend me strength. Pray to Jesus. When I opened my eyes again and looked up into the sky, my body began to float. <coughs> I was in control of the Book of Shadows. I was a legitimate practitioner of magic now. This moment felt almost like an awakening to endless new possibilities. I'm actually flying? And right next to me, flying by my side, was Sachiko. Huh, pay attention. That momentary loss of focus dropped me out of my trance, and I immediately began falling. I gripped the book even tighter and concentrated harder than before, and sure enough, I began rising toward the vortex once more. Be careful, Ayumi. It's the book that's allowing you to use these powers. You mustn't let go of it. Understood.
As I flew higher, I could see Magar sitting on the roof of the school. Looks like you managed to gain control of the Book of Shadows after all. I underestimated you, Ayumi Shinazaki. You even installed an escalator from Kisaragi Academy right up to the Nirvana. <laughs> Not too shabby. There is one more thing you should probably know, though. The Nirvana's encroachment upon and di the Nirvana's encroachment upon and direct connection to this world isn't really your fault at all. The very moment that Heavenly Host Nirvana appeared in this world. No, even farther back. At the moment the Book of Shadows was first created. The coming of this apocalypse was basically an inevitability. I looked into Magari's face. She was being completely sincere. The former owner of that book, including Yoshe Shinazaki, all tried desperately to stop it, or at least slow it down. And when they learned they couldn't, they left that fate to the next generation instead. That's why the book continued to be handed down through the ages. What that means is, this all would have happened anyway, with or without you. Save for one thing, your actions resulted in the power of the Nirvana being handed over to Misuto, the surviving member of that fucked up Yagora cult. And you do need to take responsibility for that. Responsibility. You have the real Book of Shadows. But all the power of the Nirvana broken up and distributed through Heavenly Host has been absorbed by Misuto's fake book. If you can get it back and seal it in that one though, you can easily outclass him. And if you can go one step further taking in the Nirvana's core, then that book will be complete. Now is the time to strike. Go in there and fuck him up! Before the world ends, let him see what real power tastes like. I'll be watching. Magari grew smaller as I climbed higher and higher. And as I looked up, I could see the threshold looming even larger, poised as if to wrap itself around me. Are you scared? Are you scared of dying? I don't know. Am I? I smiled at her, and to my surprise, it was a genuine smile. Somehow or another, I was feeling very calm. Tachiko looked at me with wide eyes. What's wrong? She turned away briefly, then looked over at me once more. It almost seemed in a brief moment she changed expressions in, in much the way someone would change a suit. Ayumi, what you, what you should be scared of is the gremlin and the person in the Nirvana's core. Let your dark guard down. The person in the Nirvana's core? Isn't that Misato? Uh-uh. There's someone else. I looked back up to find myself practically right on top of the hole in the sky that stood in front of the abnormally huge red moon. And when my conviction settled, I jumped in. The harsh flash, the nausea, and the wrenching tightness in my chest caused me to lose consciousness for a second. But then I awoke to find that heaven and earth had switched places. It looked as if I was falling headfirst into a massive storm with flashing lightning and roaring thunder. It almost seemed like I was previewing what the world would look like after its destruction. In the sky, there was an enormous face of a doll and the walls all around me was made of flesh. I clenched the Book of Shadows with both hands and slowly made my landing in this new version of the Nirvana. It was a mountain of rubble. What is this? Everything's broken to bits. Idiot. Oh, what the hell? Ayumi, are you okay? Yeah, I can handle this much at least. Slowly, carefully found my footing and pulled myself back up to my feet. This was an entirely different heavenly host. It bore almost no resemblance whatsoever to any version of the school we traversed previously. Heavenly host turned into this. Where are the others? 
Mochita, Nakashima, Kishinuma, Miss Kuan, Aiko. I called out to my friends but received no answer. All I could hear was the rumbling and twisting of the air around me. There was no mistaking it. In the midst of the wreckage, pieces of clothing from Kishinuma, Mochida, Nakashima, Miss Kuan, and Aiko were clearly visible. And the unfortunate souls who were wearing these clothing were all buried under fallen beams and other debris and surrounded by a veritable sea of blood. I knelt down and began sobbing uncontrollably. Misato! Show yourself! What you've done is unforgivable! Tachiko stared at me as I continued to scream and cry. What is it, Sachiko? I'll see what I can do. I can try to restore Heavenly Host Elementary's destiny. At least some small part of it. Tachiko produced a calavera necklace from her pocket. The skeletal figure of the chain made a slight hollow clinking sound as it was handled, much like an actual bone would. It looked handmade and seemed oddly warm, like a keepsake. What is that? I had this weird feeling that I'd seen this object somewhere before. I swear that looks familiar, but from where? Though she was looking down at the ground, slightly guilty and slightly guarded, Sachiko giggled slightly. This is my treasure. A big cr smile crept across her lips, and for a moment, she looked every part the bit of an ordinary little girl. I was confused. Tachiko placed her hand on the Book of Shadows. Fact loop. And the- I knew it! Okay, I, she says she recognizes it. I don't. I've never seen that thing in my life. But depend, but, but like considering what she said and the fact that she just pulled that out, I figured that was what she used to reset time all those times to make us suffer all to make us suffer so much in Book of Shadows. That's I figured that was what she was using to do that. And the book spoke. Repeat the same day. Followed by Sachiko. Suddenly, I was in Yoshe Shinazaki's clinic, the very same clinic Nakashima and I visited on that faithful day. This person is Yoshie? I was viewing Sachiko's memory of an event from long ago. Yoshie was writing something in her journal. I've analyzed the anagrams and determined that all the spells written in this book are nothing more than theories. Not one of them has ever been properly tested. There are no success rates, there's no data of any kind. So why was I naive enough to try something so foolish? I've divided everything I've had, my blood, my soul, to an end that was destined to never succeed in the first place. <laughs> and now the spells fail and the divine has escaped from the book. I've created a whole other dimension. Worst of all, all the deceased who become trapped in that dimension are erased from existence in our world. Sachiko came into the room from the back. Her eyes met with Yoshie's and she smiled. However, since I was able to suppress the stray Nirvana, Tachiko stood obediently by her mother wearing a white dress we'd seen on her in Heavenly Host. Yoshe patted her head approvingly. <laughs> Sachike, Sachiko then coughed out a fine black mist but sucked it back into her mouth like a carp. I could at least rescue one person's existence from that shadowy forgotten fate. The face on the image was blacked out, like those of Seiko and the others, however. To my surprise, the black marking was slowly peeling itself away, revealing the features underneath.
My vision slowly cleared and when it did, amidst all the rumbling and shaking, I found myself back in Heavenly Host Elementary. Then promptly, Sachiko collapsed to the ground. Without thinking, I picked her up and held her limp, light, in my, light body in my arms. She must have used up her spirit energy, as she was clearly drained. She was breathing, but only very slightly. Poor girl seems to be in pain. Wait, am I actually holding Sachiko? Sachiko was real. She had to have been, or I wouldn't have been able to hold on to her like this. She seemed injured, but not in any traditional manner. There were cracks running through her body, each one emanating an unearthly blue, almost gaseous light. Meanwhile, the school itself was also cracking and breaking all around me, making an incredible noise. The roof above began to crumble away, providing glimpses of the real world. And incredibly, the, the entity walls hadn't spawned there yet. We're back. This is before everyone died. Sachiko, hang in there. Ayumi, I'm sorry. I couldn't revert more time. No, Sachiko, thank you. That was amazing, you did great. I could hardly believe it. I just complimented Sachiko of all people on a job well done. You are praising me? Her newly found physical body was rapidly beginning to evaporate in the mist. My voice was trembling though I suspect it was less with fear and more with confusion. Yes, that was incredible. You're a good girl, Sachiko. She looked up into the sky, eyes beginning to well with tears. She was struggling to speak. Soon she wouldn't be able to at all. I wanted to apologize. She barely had any voice level, was persevering nonetheless. This was something she didn't want to leave unsaid no matter what. I know you can never forgive me, but I wanted to apologize anyway. And with that, she began full on crying. Hachiko, I couldn't help doing the same. I killed a lot of people. I'm not a good girl. You shouldn't praise someone like me. The tears were streaming down my face now. Sachiko's voice was so mournful, so genuine. But you just saved a lot of people now too. So thank you. A massive earthquake shook the ground. Sachiko looked scared, so I patted her head and hugged her tightly. She then looked at me squarely in the eye gripping her calavera necklace tightly in her hands as if it was a rosary. It's strange, isn't it? Once you know more than you did, right? Once you know you did right, passing on isn't so scary anymore. Sachiko? Sachiko and the blue light alike both disappeared completely. She was gone. The being I was hugging just moments ago no longer existed. All I could do was clench my fists and mourn. The look on Sachiko's face when she asked if I was scared of dying kept flashing through my head. Sachiko, you were the one who was scared, weren't you? I kept my head hung low for a moment and stood up and wiped my tears from my eyes. Accompanying the sound of the rumbling, one single entity wall now stood in the real world. The cycle was beginning anew. Watch over me, Sachiko. One Shinazaki to another. Praise the girl unfair, Sachiko. <laughs> Shut up. Holy!
Holy crap. Guys, guys. Is Ayumi gonna be the GOAT? Uh, it, it, look, my relationship with Ayumi has always been kind of, you know, so what, it kind of hate, not hate, but just understanding hate. She aggravates me because, because of the way, because of the way she acts and stuff. But I understand why she acts the way that she does, but it still aggravates me, you know? The one thing I've always wanted to see from Ayumi was determination and lasting determination. We've seen it in, in Course Party, the first game, she had that determination that went away immediately. You feel me? She never stuck with it. If she can stick with this determination, I genuinely think I might be able to come to like Ayumi. But this is so good. I love this. Oh man, that scene with Sachiko and Ayumi had me tearing up a little bit. But you know, nothing dropped, you know, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gangster. Hold on. But I'm not going to lie. They were welling up. I'm not going to lie. But man, I always knew Sachiko was a sweetheart. I always knew she was a sweetheart. But man i'm addicted to this game that's the end of the episode guys be on enjoy like subscribe with a comment and read them all tap into the next one i cannot wait for chapter eight hold on let's see i can't wait for chapter eight i'm excited i'm extremely excited i can't wait to play it peace out i love you guys